You know what you're listening to? Is that a trick question? It's the I Still Love This Game podcast with your host, Matthew Damien. He's an idiot. Don't listen to this. He's an idiot. Hi, and welcome to episode 12 of the I Still Love This Game podcast. In this week's show, we have a very special guest, a former Naismith College Player of the Year, a 15-year veteran of the NBA who played in over 1,000 games for 12 different franchises, and a number one uh, overall pick of the NBA draft. We've got Joe Smith. Joe, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. How's it going? It's going good. It's, it's good. We had some uh, technical difficulties. Uh, I've got difficulty saying it, technical difficulties in the previous one, but we're, we're up and rolling right now. And, of course, it's an honor having you. Uh, before we go on, we've got a lot of topics to, to discuss, but there's something I did want to address. Okay. And uh, I wanted to make it clear to the audience that we won't be talking about the contract situation with the Minnesota Timberwolves and Joe Smith. Uh, now, this was my call. It wasn't Joe's uh, decision. And the reason for that is I wanted to talk about Joe's career. I mean, there's plenty to talk about. A lot of teams he played for, uh, a very <laughs> illustrious college career, and there's, there's plenty of content there. So if you want to learn about the, if you want to have a opinion or you want to hear about the contract situation, get me in touch with Glenn Taylor. I'll happily discuss it with him, but I'm not going to discuss it. <laughs> I'm not going to discuss it with Joe. Uh, you cool with that, Joe? Oh yeah, I'm good with that. <laughs> okay, absolutely. So I with like that how you that. Give me that to Glenn Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> That's on him. That's all on you, man. Give me, give me the, the number of your, your former agent. I'll talk to him about it. Uh, so yeah, with, with, with that in mind, let's start right at the beginning. Uh, and your college okay. career. You were you were only a mm-hmm. sophomore when you decided to, cl- to declare. You had some huge college moments. Obviously, dropping forty. On uh, on the uh, Blue Devils and at Cameron uh, Indoor uh, Stadium or Arena, I'm not sure what that's called. And you got the buzzer yeah. beater. Do you do you remember that game yeah. specifically? Is that your is that your favorite college game that you played in? Um, it probably it was it was one of my favorite. I wouldn't say my favorite. I don't, really don't have a favorite, but it's definitely one of my favorite. Um, uh, to go into Duke, which is probably one of the toughest and the uh, toughest arenas to play in, especially in the ACC back at that time. Um, and come out and, and and come away with 40 points and like you said, tip it in at the at the, at the buzzer. That's and not just 40 points, but I also had like 20 rebounds and um, I mean maybe three or four blocks in that game as well. So I mean it was it was a tough. I mean it was a, it was a great game on both ends of the floor. I felt you know uh, with that game, Coach Williams he was actually out. He had pneumonia, so he was in the hospital. Mm. So yeah. one of our assistant coaches was was coaching the game, uh, Billy Hahn. He was coaching the game, so you know it was kind of like a. Uh, he just uh, before the game he told me, I, I said, I need you, big fella. <laughs> just go out and just, go out and make it happen for me. So that's what you know. That's what I, you know. I try to do, and that's what at the end of the day, that's what happened. Is that was that the game where you sort of in your mind convinced you in your mind? Because I'm 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 assuming like you obviously it was your dream to play in the NBA, but did you ever have right. doubt? That you were going to make it when you started college, and was that a, a, one of those games? Was like, no, nope, I'm ready for the next level. Um, I mean, I'm gonna tell you, like uh, when I first got to Maryland, I mean, I wasn't even, you know, one of the top 150 uh, uh, or 200 uh, recruits in the nation. So I really, and you know, the NBA dream was there. I mean, obviously playing every basketball player, but I really didn't know that I had the talent to make it there. Um, probably until I think the first game that really um, gave me the confidence that I could make it to that next level was my very first game at Maryland, and that was against Georgetown. And they had uh, Othella Harrington on the team who had just won uh, Big East Rookie of the Year, uh, uh, Freshman of the Year the year before. And uh, that was probably, the, you know, that was a big talk, talk of the town. You know, Maryland and Georgetown was automatically a big game, but that was a big talk of the town with how Othella Harrington was going to tear, tear us up you know, he was going to do this and he was going to do that and um, uh, in the newspapers, on the news and everything. And, uh, you know, going into that game, I was, you know, my very first, you know, college game, probably the most nervous I've ever been in my life. Um, I really didn't know what to expect. So I was kind of nervous going into that game. Um, but at the end of the day, at the end of the game, we came away with the win. And 
And I ended up with like 26, nine, and like three or four blocks. And, uh, you know, ended up uh, uh, being a big key up down the stretch, you know, sealing the game. And that, that right there, you know, kind of let me know that I had a chance and I had the opportunity to make it to that next level. Okay. Um, so we've talked a little bit about your college career. Obviously, you made it to the um, you made it to the elite eight, yes, in the in your second season, in your sophomore. No, season? the furthest I made was a sixteen. Yeah, oh, you the furthest you got was six two, sixteen. Yeah. yeah, both years. Okay, so you're you're a sophomore, and for the uh, listeners at home, you're probably thinking a sophomore declaring that's probably not that rare, but back then that was really rare. Uh, and to yeah. be taken first overall, I think uh, Magic Johnson might have been the the previous one to go number one overall as a sophomore. Um, as a sophomore, I believe so, because I think at that time I might have been the fourth number one. Uh, I mean, fourth sophomore to go at that time. Right. So yeah, it was very nice to believe Magic was the one, but the last one before prior to me. Right. So what went into the decision to actually declare? Was it uh, did you have a lot of uh, was it was it just strictly a decision you made by yourself or did you have support from your coaching or, or your family or your teammates or did you have mentors? Uh, what, what went into that decision? I mean, it was. <laughs> I mean, besides the mentor part, I mean, it was pretty much all the above. You know, from coaches, uh, Coach Williams to my mom, my family, uh, to my teammates. I mean, uh, Coach Williams and I, we sat down in the office uh, before I made my decision and. Uh, he knew I had a big decision coming up, and, and then he knew it was one that had to be made. You know, and, uh, before the, before we even started our next season, or even thought about starting the next season, you know, it was something that had to be made. So we sat down in his office, and um, you know, at the end of our, we had a long conversation. And at the end of the conversation, he was like, uh, "I was in your shoes. I was, you know, I, w- I would take this opportunity and, 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 and declare myself for the draft." You know, and um, you know that was one. Uh, uh, one confirmation that I needed, and then I went home from there and talked to my mom. We actually went to breakfast and um, had a, had a, uh, another long conversation. You know, we talked about the pros and cons of everything, and um, uh, you know, I told her how I thought about things, and you know, she pretty much left the decision up to me at the end of the day, and uh, uh, went back to uh, went back talked discussed it a few times. My teammates, they all told me to just go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to touch you know. him, man. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they all told me to go, go, go. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, it was, it was pretty much from then on a, uh, a load off my back knowing that I had support and, and I, from everybody. Um, nobody was, you know, uh, you know, no one was negative about anything, about the decision, whether it was to stay or leave, to stay or to leave. So uh, it, it was an easier decision on my behalf, and I felt – you know, it was the right opportunity for me. Time was right. I didn't want to risk coming back for my junior year and risking an injury and then not being able to get drafted at all. So I felt I thought the time was right. I had a great sophomore year, just one player of the year, nation of player of the year, and a few more accolades. And, you know, I thought the timing was right. Yeah, well, you couldn't argue with the results. I mean, you went number one overall. Did you... Yes, ma'am. Did you have any idea that the Warriors were going to take you first overall? Did you have an idea that you were going to be top five or a lottery pick, or did, or you didn't really matter to you? You just wanted to make it. What was your? Um, <laughs> I mean, I the, the, you know the, the conversations and the, you know the, the uh, draft predictions. You know they 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 you know the, the rankings change all the time. So uh, or the draft order changes all the time. So I mean they had me projected in the top five. Um, you know which. Uh, you know, either way, I was good with because the teams that that were picking that year in the top five, everybody had struggled the year before. So it's not like I was going to a, a team that uh, uh, you know was, was, was one that had a choice. You know, with, from a team that was successful the year before. But I think the year the, uh, the draft, being drafted by the Warriors was key for me because you know they had so many veterans on that team that uh, when I got drafted from Chris Mullen, Latrell Sprewell, Tim Hardaway. Uh, Chris Gatlin at the time. I mean, they had so many veterans on the team that's been through the battles and been through the wars before. That once I got there, it was, it was they, they took me under their wings and they all taught me different things on, you know, how to survive a season, how to pace myself, and how to maintain my body. So I mean, that was I think that was a good, uh, 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 a good choice for 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 me being chosen by the Warriors. Yeah, I I think they made the the right choice. Obviously, I'm, I, when you look at the, the way Thank their you. roster was built, 
mean, you look at the way they're running. Yeah. Well. <laughs> the way they had, they had they had they had Tim Hardaway, they had BJ Armstrong. They got BJ uh, from Toronto. Um, yeah. Ronnie Cycli. They had they had they they needed a four. But your game at that time, exactly. I, I think you're more of a hybrid small forward slash power forward. I don't think you um, you kind of like to the people who are listening who haven't watched. Any of those games? I think Chris Bosch, a right-handed Chris Bosch, and right. Do you think that might have might have hindered you a little bit? One, the the, the expectations of being a number one pick, where mm-hmm. it, they didn't really give you time to really develop your game. They were like, okay, you're six foot ten. You, we need a four. You're going to play the four. Get in the post. Even though I think at that right. time your strength was more of a face up shooter and then put the ball on the floor a little bit. It definitely was. Yep. Okay. And that's why I think uh, that's what was key early in my early in my career. I mean, I was um, I was a Rick Adam and my coach, uh, the coach who drafted me. I mean, he allowed me to do that for my first couple of years, um, get the ball face up, you know, mm-hmm. uh, move out on the floor and not play so much with my back to the basket. Uh, uh, even uh, even when I did, I might, uh, we, we drew up flex cuts or whatever for me to get the ball in the post. It was more mid post where I was able to either face up and you know use my quickness, or either just turn around and shoot a fadeaway, turn around jumper, or if the guy was smaller, you know, and and, and, and that was I was pretty consistent with that shot. So um, I think Rick Adelman did a great job with that. But then as I moved on a little bit, my role changed, so things changed up a little bit. Sure. Okay, so you're now in the NBA. So we're going to just try to do like a timeline here, but we're now in you're now in the NBA. And you've gone mm-hmm. from scoring 40 points on Cherokee Park to your very first game. <laughs> uh, sorry, I had to throw that in there. Uh, your very first game <laughs> was up against a team of large one in the Houston Rockets. Now, you told me off air, and I didn't pick up on this, but that was actually ring night. Mm-hmm. So walk us yeah. through that entire experience of going, from going to college to your very first game, going up against the team and Clyde Drexler on their championship ring night. And just the difference right. in atmosphere and, and and the entire experience. I mean, it was. I mean, that that. I mean, it was always automatic, automatically uh, a great experience going into that night. Just being my opening NBA game, my first game of my career, and and things like that. But I mean, it made it even more special knowing that it was ring night for the Houston Rockets, who had just won the championship the year before I got drafted. So uh, it was ring night for them. We were in Houston on the road. And I was going up against Hall of Famers <laughs> as a rookie, yeah. you know, as as a starting power forward rookie. You know, I'm guarding Charles Barkley that night. I have Akeem Olajuwon on the floor, Clyde Drexler, got, you know, guys like that, Hall of Famers, uh, uh, future Hall of Famers at that time, but now all present Hall of Famers. But, uh, you know, going up against those guys, uh, that made it even more nerve-wracking. Uh, but it was a great experience, man. Ring night, just to experience that moment, my first game of the season. Um, uh Seeing the commissioner there, seeing the rings being being handed out, and 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 the banners being raised, the banner being raised into the into the rafters, you know the the the, the excitement in the crowd, you know it was it was great, man. It was almost almost like a college atmosphere, but you know obviously you know uh, college you got you got the student section that just that's just rowdy all all the time, but. Um, I mean, it was you can call them drunk. It's it okay. Was, it you can say drink. that they're drunk. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, <laughs> they have their fun. I can say that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a very good way to put it. Was, it was, well done. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking of, uh, speaking uh, of fun situations, on the 30th mm-hmm. of January in 96, you played against the Lakers. And that happened to be Magic Johnson's return game to the NBA. Right. I've got right. a lot of questions regarding that. So, first of all, <laughs> at, what, at what point did you realize the stars were aligning and that was going to be up against you guys? Um, I believe he announced his return maybe a month or two before, prior, but uh, they had no date set. So, I believe they set a, a date maybe the date that his date his return date was set maybe a couple weeks prior to uh when the game was actually uh played. And uh once they announced that date, you know, I was like, Oh, that's against us. They you know, you <laughs> they return it against you know, you see it on Sports Center, ESPN, you know, Magic's return against his return date is against 
scheduled to be against the Golden State Warriors and da 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 da. Um, but deep down inside, you know why they expected that to be his return date because they think that's going to be an easy game. But even though I mean, but but I grew up such a big Magic Johnson fan that you know I didn't even think or care about that. You know, I just wanted wanted to have the opportunity to to be on the floor and play against him because. Uh, like we talked about off air a little bit. Once we got off, uh, uh, once he retired, you know, I never thought I was, I would, I would ever be able to play against him. And I grew up a huge fan of Magic Johnson, and he actually was my idol. You know, my favorite player growing up, and that's why I wore 32 most of my career. But I mean, you know, and and like you said, like I said, even when he retired, I didn't expect to ever have the opportunity to play against him. And uh, when I made that announcement, man, it it it. It, it was a big thrill for me, and 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 when the, the night of the, the day of the, the day of the game was an even bigger thrill for me when he uh, uh, checked into the game because he didn't start the game. He mm-hmm. came in off the bench, and and uh, we were at the forum, and he came in off the bench, and maybe midway through the first quarter, and you could just hear the murmurs in the crowd, just hear it just building up, building up as he. Uh, as, as Dale Harris calls him, and he's coming down towards the scores table, scores table, you just hear it building up, building up, building up. And then all of a sudden, you know, the crowd is just erupting, and he's checking into the game. And at that time, it was a foul, and whoever he was checking in for, that's who I was guarding, I believe. Um, I can't remember who it was. Eldon Campbell? Whoever he was checking in for, I believe it was Eldon. Yeah, because Lottie was a five. Yeah, Eldon was a four, so it was Eldon Campbell he was checking in for. So he was checking in for Eldon, and uh, someone was at the fi- someone was at the foul line, and he came and stood right beside me. And as soon as he stood, there, I just got chills. My body just <laughs> like it was, <laughs> you know, I, I got excited. I was nervous, excited, you know, just to just to know that I had this opportunity to play against Magic, my idol, my favorite player, you know, someone I looked up to or that off the floor. And uh, I never thought I would have that opportunity, but I mean, it was it's probably one of the best games that. Uh, best game moments that I had in my career. Yeah, I, I watched the the highlight video of it, and I, I just came across it randomly in, in preparing the uh, the show notes. And if you yeah. haven't watched it, go check it out on YouTube. It's, it's one of the most exciting regular season games you'll ever come across because Magic nearly gets a triple double, and I think it yeah. was one of his first plays. It's the ball fake on the trail Sprewell to the corner. <laughs> <laughs> and and I have never and this is just on YouTube. It's not even on TV, right? This is when I was watching it. And you know, twenty years later, I'm watching it and I'm getting chills just off that one ball fake. Um, right. he, you, you were guarding him. He he was playing before. He was bulked up. Uh, the which is a yeah. very <laughs> nice way of putting it. He uh, he was a little bit slower, but he was it was much more of a post post player at that time. They had Nick Van Exel. They had Eddie Jones, Sabolas. So the, the mm-hmm. spot for him was really to play the four, and here you are as a rookie, uh, having the guard magic. Did he say anything to you? Did he do anything, did, or were you just already? Did he, do you think he could already? Do you think maybe he was just as nervous as what you were? Or? Um, he didn't say much, but I do think he was just as nervous. I mean, anytime you take a, take some time off and you know come back to you know a game, uh, the game of, of basketball, any any game. Um, you know, your first game is always going to be a nervous moment for you. So I think he was probably just as nervous as I was. Um, you know, I'd handle it better because he was a veteran at it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, it was, uh, 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 like you said, we, I had to guard him and, uh, that was another special moment knowing that I had to guard him. I mean, just, uh, uh, you know, when he retired before he left the game, he was obviously out on the floor a lot more, but he played the four when he came back. So, he started off in the post a lot during that game, but as he got into a rhythm and he got into the floor, th- into the swing of things, you know, he started uh, becoming the old magic. And that's when you saw that part, that 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 uh, pass fake to the corner for the layup, and then that's when he started getting into the rhythm, into the floor of things, and uh, uh, you can start seeing, you know, some some uh, uh, some showcases of you know the, the old magic. Right. Um... At what point did you realize? Did you guys realize? Was it in the scouting that hey, he may you you may have to cover him because obviously the Lakers aren't going to announce oh we're going to play him at the four. So right. obviously when he came in for Eldon Campbell and he started going into into those spots, you, you you're the one guarding him. Did you know that you were going to be the one guarding him, or or was that just like a on the fly coaching strategy? Or 
No, we prepare both ways. That was the thing about it. We prepare both ways, whether he was going to play out on the floor or, or, or in the post. I think most of the time I was going to be guarding him anyway because of his size, whether he was out on the floor or in the post. Uh, um, uh, I think it was scheduled for me to guard him in any way. But if he was playing more on the perimeter, um, I think it was going to be – I think we had Jerome Kersey on our team at that time, and he was going to do most of the guarding on the perimeter. Uh, the more he came inside, then we was going to switch it up. But he played more. He started off at the four, so it was initially on me right from the jump. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that must have been awesome, though. When you think about the, the talent level of, of uh, for somebody to come back after, what was it, four years? Four years of, of really uh, – yeah. he, he really retired in at the dream team. Like, that, that was the last time he played any structured mm-hmm. basketball. And for him to come back and put up a triple double, and that wasn't the only game that he played well in. You know, there was games against Orlando and um, and Miami yeah. where he posted huge, huge numbers. And that's people often disrespect him. I think when they look at him historically and they say, oh, "Well, he was slow. He couldn't play defense or whatever." I just, oh, just look God. at look at look look at the feel that he has <laughs> to be able to come back after that length and to play a different position. Right. Granted, it's still the skill set, exactly. as you said, like. But it's, it's that, that, that's incredible to me. I've got him as my top three, four players of all time, easily. And I wouldn't argue with anyone who said that he's even number one or number two. Right, and I'm the same way. I mean, like I said, he's always been my favorite player. And like you said, for anybody to take any time, you take as a basketball player or anybody any any sport, uh, but especially basketball because of the rhythm that you must have, you know, to mm-hmm. to, to maintain in order to, you know, uh, be productive out there on the floor. It's, it's, it's t- you take a week off, you kind of you you start losing that rhythm a little bit. So to take four years off, like you said, and I'm quite sure he couldn't practice too much because he was you know going through his medical process and and things like that. So he couldn't really practice too much and 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 stay in too too good of a basketball shape. So for him to come back and be able to make it through that season and play the way he played, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it was it was great for me to see. I I, I love watching it. Well, I thought it was the perfect spawn song for him. I'm, I'm glad he was able to leave on his own terms. I think a lot of great players don't get that opportunity, uh, and, and right. it, was, it was good. To, it was good to see him. He, he earned that. He deserved it. And um, and especially yeah, okay. after when he how he, especially after he went out and you know everybody all the chitter chatter about you know uh, from from different players and you know different. Uh, uh, people, you know, uh, uh, about what he was going through, you know, I, 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 that was, that made that moment even more special to see him back out there on the floor. Yeah, that's, that's well said, man. Um, keeping along with your career, I don't want to turn this into a Magic Johnson podcast. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, no, no, get you back I can on talk about week. Magic all day if you want to. Oh, <laughs> all right, all right. Wait, free next week, let's, let's talk about Magic for now. Um, <laughs> getting back to your career, though, your first two seasons, See, a lot of people are quick to say that you didn't live up to the expectations of being a number one pick. I would argue with that because your first two seasons I, were very successful. You were uh, right. second in the in rookie of the year voting. You would have won it had you been in another situation. Damon on got into the perfect I, well, situation. I think I still should have won it. Well, there you yeah. go. <laughs> I think I still should have won it. <laughs> but, uh, they said the league's rigged. Maybe this is rigged too. Um, but... I, had you been in a – people forget you were playing – as you said, you Golden State had a lot of talent. They had a lot of veteran talent. Spree was, was obviously the number one option. Chris Mullen was right. still effective in shooting. You had uh, Tim Hardaway for a while. He was traded mid-season. You still had BJ Armstrong. So there was a lot of mouths to right. so to speak, on the offensive end. Now, you compare that to Damon Stoudemire, who had who was on an expansion team. Of course, he's going to be the first, second, third option. You were – Everything. Yeah, exactly. and, you still, and you still put up massive numbers in a in a position yeah. that you weren't really familiar with or comfortable with just yet. Your skills have evolved into being a true four. And uh, right, exactly. Yeah, I, I think you were the most impressive rookie that year. It was, it was out of you, and I was outsized every night. That's what people always forget. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Right, and um, <laughs> but uh, in your second season, you averaged twenty and ten. And people might think, oh, that's not that impressive. But back then it was because the pace of the game was totally different as compared to now. Just for a comparison, right. state, those numbers are very uh, comparable with... So you were, what, 21 in your second year? Were you 21 years old? Uh, yeah, 21, exactly. At, yes. 
at 21, that's very similar to what Kevin Garnett was putting up, 20 and 10. So for people who right. are too quick to say, oh, you, you're a bust or whatever, I, I would argue that's why I'm blue in the face because when you had the opportunities, I think you're very productive. Mm -hmm. And we never really got a chance to see you as the number one option. It would have been a very different situation had you been the number one option. Now, and I agree. I agree with that as well. <laughs> of course you would, Joe. You wouldn't disagree with that, would you? <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, no, but no, but I mean, like like you said, like uh, with uh, my second year with Rick Gatterman and, and PJ Carlismo as our coach, yeah, coaches, uh, splitting coaches that year, um, it was, it, it was, I was more involved in the offense. You know, I was, I was getting the ball, you know, in, in spots where I was comfortable. I was getting the ball, uh, you know, getting more touches where I can get into a rhythm. Um, but as I moved on, my role changed up, you know, on different teams. But like I went to Philadelphia, so obviously Allen, Allen Averson, you know, he's a, he's going to get more, most of the shots with that team. Um, so my role changed up with that team. With uh, Minnesota, my role changed up that team as well with Kevin, you know, being the go-to guy. So, you know, I, and, 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 you know, that's why I agree with you when you say my career wasn't a bust because, you know, I was able to adjust my, my role and, and still be successful on every team that I've been on. So um, uh, my, my number might not have been called, but I can still go out there and get you 14, 15 points, you know, just offensive rebound and doing dirty, you know, doing the dirty work. Um, uh, so to go from being a go-to guy to a guy that can be able to do the dirty work and handle handle the dirty stuff as well and still put buckets in the, and still, you know, put the ball in the hole. You know, that's why I, I can agree with you when you say my, my career wasn't a bust. Well, I wasn't just saying that. But, you know, but um, there's one thing that I noticed later on in your career, too, especially with you and in Cleveland, you played some big games there. We'll get to that, too, but just we're, we're on the topic now. Okay. Is people may not have really paid attention to you, but you watch how other teams paid attention to you, and they never backed off you. So if if you're playing right. inside LeBron or whatever, and you got the ball, they weren't like they weren't thinking. Okay, that's a win. It, the ball's out of his hands, and it's in Joe Smith's hands. We can back off now. It's not right. like a raise on Rondo. Like, okay, shoot that jumper. Let's see what you can do. No, that's not more, at all. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they were fully aware, and that's the greatest respect I think. And I think fans need to go beyond right. the box score a little bit and actually want, watch the game, and then they'll be able to see the respect that you had from your opposition, and that's all you need to know. And you know what else? Exactly. All you need to know is a thousand that. games. A thousand games. If you were right. a <laughs> exactly. look, at, look at Michael Bennett. Michael Bennett was a number one pick a few years ago. He didn't even finish his rookie contract. That's a bust. Right. right. A thousand games. Exactly. People would kill to play five games. You played a thousand of them. So if anyone <laughs> wants to say that that was a bust, you know what? Go back to playing video games. Um, <laughs> no, I now, appreciate that. <laughs> no worries, man. Uh, in your third season, though, so things were going pretty well. You were developing, mm -hmm. you know, putting some good numbers up. In your third season, however, it started to get a little bit shaky. And I wanted to talk to you or get your your thoughts on what happened between uh, Latrell Spearwell and PJ Carlissimo. Now, I don't want to uh, also analyze anything here, but you were there. Uh, is right. that something you could sense? Because obviously the team is not living up to... Uh, expectations because there was a lot of talent there so you guys weren't winning it was early in the season was was there right. a lot of tension between Spreewell he, obviously he was the he was as you said he was the man he was the the, the first option on offense so he was the star of the team Definitely. yeah you had a new coach in Carlissimo so right. did you see something like that happening were you shocked that it happened obviously not to that extent but or was it completely out of the blue was it just was it a snap moment like tell us what happened um, no, I mean, I, actually it was something that was brewing for a while. I mean, and like you said, it was very early in the season. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, we were still early in the season. And, uh, uh, Latrell was actually, he was our leading scorer. He was averaging almost, I can believe, maybe 30 a game at that point. And, uh, uh, you know, it was just something that, I mean, both sides, you know, they, uh, you, sometimes you just have two guys that just can't click. You know, and, and right. that's what it was. You know, it was coming from coach. It was coming from Spree. It was, I mean, both sides. So it was something that was growing. Um, you can almost see it coming, but like, like you said, not to that extent, but you can almost see it coming, seeing some type of altercation coming. 
Um, as a young player, I didn't expect that to happen. I didn't expect to see, you know, uh, anything like that of that nature happen. But I mean, you can you can see it brewing up. You can see, you know, uh, you know, with the two uh, alpha makers like that in the building, you know, you, you can see it happening. Okay. Well, it was unfortunate. Uh, it was, I, I think Very. maybe some better management could have prevented that because Sprewell obviously went on to having, you know, he went to the finals the next year after the lockout. So he was obviously, and he was a right. best player on that Knicks along with Alan Houston. People think Patrick Ewing, but yeah. at that stage of his career, not so much. Um, it's just right. unfortunate that they couldn't have, you know, figured it out and sat the two down and said, look, we both, we, we both want to get to the same spot. We're going about it the different ways and we're just going into a chaos thing. Um, and I think, I mean, the thing about it, I mean, if, if, if we could have worked it out, I mean, because uh, at that point, Spree and I, we were like, uh, uh, as far as tandem, we were first and second behind Jordan and Pippen in the league in scoring. So it was like, yeah. if we could have worked it out. We just, we may have gotten that season turned around because like, it was very early. It was very early. And uh, we had a ways to go, so we if we could have got things worked out. We may have could have, could have got things turned around. Yeah, unfortunately though, that as I said, it sent you in a tailspin, or the team in the tailspin. You were still putting up big numbers, but then at right. the, uh, just before the trade deadline in in nineteen ninety eight, uh, you were traded to Philly, uh, which surprised yeah. a lot of people, <laughs> considering what they what Philly ended up giving up for you, which made no sense whatsoever. Uh, Right. Do you have any ideas that the Warriors were looking <laughs> to move in a new direction, or uh, or was it shocking to you? Or what happened? There? Did you have talks to them about maybe an extension that went awry, or what happened? There? Um, I mean, the, the the timing was a surprise, but right after the uh, Spreewell incident with uh, Coach Carlissimo, I mean, you, there was talks of uh, you know, kind of. Um, Rebuilding everything, you know, starting everything over, you know, uh, getting fresh body, fresh people in there and, and, and trying to, you know, establish something new, uh, with the Warriors. So, um, you know, there was a lot of talk about, you know, different, play, different people being traded and moved around and different things like that. But the timing really shocked me because, uh, <laughs> there was no phone call or anything prior to. I was actually in a hotel room in Portland preparing for a game, getting ready to go. Uh, to the arena and play against the Trailblazers, and um, I'm ordering room service, and I cut my TV on. I just wake up from my nap, and I cut my TV on uh, on Sports Center, which I always watch before I go to the arena. And um, you know, there it is on the bottom line. You know, Joe Smith traded to the 76. Joe Smith and Brian Shaw traded to the Philadelphia 76ers, and I'm like, what? So then, maybe two or three minutes later, I get a phone call from my agent, and you know, he. He's explaining everything. He's explaining everything to me then, but um, it, kind yeah, like a, uh, it kind of sounds like a, a girlfriend that found you, found out that you're cheating. You're trying to talk to her. It's like you, you should <laughs> you found out already. You're I know, kidding. you know. <laughs> <laughs> like I thought we was okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what what a weird way to find out. Why didn't the team call you? Why didn't they give you a heads up? That's a rhetorical question. That's a, I, I don't want you to answer. But it was, no, I know. It's, 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 it's mind blowing to me. That, 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 that's just honestly, it just sounds unclassy. I said that like, why would they right, let you find means, out by ESPN? And that's uh, I don't know, but I'm not the only player that that I've heard that happen to. I mean, I've heard that happen to a few other players as well, where they find out that you know after the fact. And mm. um, but that's the only time it's just, that was the only time that happened to me. I mean, obviously sometimes I moved because of free agency, but as far as trade wise, every other trade or anything like that that went down, I was either notified or asked asked, asked about it beforehand. So I mean, that was always the respect and 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 and, and uh, that they gave me around the league, except for that one team. Um. Except um, for that one time, because I was a young fella that they, 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 didn't, right? they didn't give a <laughs> care about. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but there's something I wanted to point out, though. You were saying that the Warriors wanted to move in a new direction. Right. Did that, I'm just trying to gather my, my thoughts here. You were, now you were 22, right? So you would have just been mm -hmm. uh, a senior in college. So let's put that in perspective. Right. And... You, you, the previous season, you were 20 and 10. Uh, I'm not sure what your specific stats were at this stage, but I'm sure they were similar for this season. 
Right. And you dealt with the Spreewell situation. The, 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 the season's been in turmoil. Why wouldn't they build mm-hmm. around you? Once again, it's a rhetorical question, but why wouldn't they build around you instead of trading <laughs> for Clarence Weatherspoon and, and Jimmy Jackson, who look, Jimmy Jackson had a good career too, right? But at that stage, if they're trying to go in a new, fresh direction, wouldn't they build it around a yeah. 22-year-old star player? But once again, we're sorry, we're I'm sorry, Joe. Sorry, Joe. Some of that makes you wonder, though. <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble. It, it makes you wonder, though, doesn't it? And, and, and you know what? They, they kind of, in all fairness, they did the same thing with Chris, with Chris Webber. They traded him for, on, on the spur of the moment, a couple of years prior to, I think it was for Tom Guglielmo. Mm-hmm. And, you yep. know, there, there's, there's, a re, there's probably, when we looked at it and we talked about the talent, that, you know, with Spreewell, Mullen, Tim Hardaway uh, on that team, there's probably a reason why all that talent couldn't match, and they probably had very little to do with the players or coaches. And we we'll probably should, should just leave it at that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you I mean at that time, it. they had so many, like, at that, at that time, there was so many moving pieces, and that's the mm. thing about it. Nobody really, no one really had a chance, had a chance to gel. I mean, even my rookie year, we were moving pieces. We were moving Timmy. We were moving... Uh, we're getting Ronnie cycling. We're doing moving, you know, we're moving people here and there. Then my next year, we're moving again. We're moving more people. Then we're changing coaches. And we had like so much moving and so much, there was no stability where we could actually build something. So we never got really got a good shot. Right. But, uh, the good thing about that trade, or maybe it was a bad thing, let me t- let you tell me, is, um, <laughs> you you went to a completely different team, but they, they seemed like they were they were getting a little bit more stability. I mean, they traded Stackhouse earlier that year, but they still had Barry Brown, they still mm-hmm. had Iverson. How hard was it, or was it uh, how hard was it to fit in? At, you're still only 22 to fit right. into an entirely new system where there is accountability, there is structure, but. You know, did they say, okay, this is what we want you to do. We want you to come off the bench, but these are the roles you're going to get. This is the position on the court you're going to get. Or is it kind of like, okay, this is what we're going to do, but the onus is on you to get comfortable and, and get familiar with this on the fly? Uh, I mean, pretty much what you just said. I mean, you, you, they they have a system already in place. Um, they have a go-to guy, you know, with Allen. They have... Uh, uh, um, everyone, you know, uh, plan their role. Everyone know their role. And um, here comes a guy that's used to getting the ball and used to, you know, being a, a, another scorer. Um, so it took a, it, it was a tough adjustment at first for a young for a young for a young player. But um, one the only good thing is the good thing about it is I played with Allen, you know, as as kids playing AAU basketball. So we started playing together since we were maybe nine or ten years old. So I kind of you know understood his game and understood where to get where to uh, uh, get my looks, but at the same time, it was still a system that had to be run, and, you know, I couldn't just go out there and freelance and try and, you know, find, you know create create spots or find openings. I still had to uh, play my role and, and find my role, which uh, uh, was tough at first, but, you know, I, I kind of uh, got a hold of it, got a grasp of it, and, and I understood it after a while. Right. Was Larry Brown a, a tough coach to play for? No, not at all. Not at all. Larry's, I mean, Larry's probably uh, one of the best coaches I've played for. I mean, he's he's uh, very detailed. I mean, he's very fundamentally sound. He, he wants you to uh, uh, use your pivots. He wants you to, when you're going right, dribble with your right. You're going left, dribble. You know, he's very fundamentally right. sound. It's not like very, and that's how most of our practices work. Um, you know, before we even started going up and down five on five or doing our, our, our going over our plays, most of our our, our warm ups and practices was you know doing reverse layups, doing layups, one or two dribble pull ups, and you know just fun, a bunch of fundamental stuff uh, that I think you know uh, really helps you out in the game and, and really keeps you uh, in rhythm and keeps your skills up to par. Uh, so I I, 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 re- I love that part of practice a lot. It sounds like he was still in college mode. So obviously, he, he was a college coach for a while. It sounds right. like he was really developing the plays, which is probably what would have helped you out more than anything in, in Golden State. So it sounds like it was good. Uh, when I say good, I mean, obviously, you were coming off the bench with Philly to start off with. 
It, right. it sounds like it was, it was a, maybe it was a breath of fresh air that you needed uh, getting out of Golden State. But um, we talked a bit about Sprewell and uh, the situation he had with Carlissimo. Iverson, uh, did you ever feel there was any clashes with Iverson and Larry Brown? Because that's talked about a lot that Iverson was uncoachable or, or, or nonsense like that. I wanted to hear from right. a player that played with him. Was he uncoachable? Was he uh, very receptive to Brown? Um, I wouldn't say he's uncoachable, but they did. I mean, he's a he's a feisty guy. He hates to lose, yeah. and he wants to do whatever it take, whatever he can to help his team be successful. And sometimes uh, it wasn't on the same game plan with the game, same game plan as, as Larry. But I mean, you know, they 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 and you know they would clash every once in a while. But I mean, Larry Larry respected him. He respected Larry, and and there was really uh, besides you know moments like that where. You know, because like I said, Larry is very uh, uh, in tune with system, and when he when he you know when he wants the system, to how he wants the system to run and 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 be effective is is his way. So once you start interfering with that, then you're going to obviously bump heads with any coach. Sure. Now you were only there for about thirty games. Obviously, they didn't make the playoffs, but they they played a lot better in the in that second half of the season as opposed to the first half. So mm-hmm. that was probably growing pains for them. But they, as I said, they, they made a few changes, the stack house for, for Rat, Rattler trade, and then obviously yourself. Right. Um, or they brought in Eric Snow as well, which was a big component to their finals run. But Defense. after... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he, he fit in a, He really allowed Iverson to play the uh, the, the two-guard uh, role. Um, exactly. After that, after that season... They, uh, the lockout happened, obviously, Jordan's retirement and then the lockout, um, and we talked off air about what a nasty lockout that was. It looked like it was going to chew up the entire season. Uh, right. What was, what was that experience like? Because th- this is only your third year in the, in the league, and all of a sudden it's looking, looking like you might miss an entire season of basketball. What did, you, what did you do to stay in shape? Did you stay in touch with guys? Or? Um, I mean, the thing about it, I, I, uh, most of the times when players are uh, away from the game, it's not like you know, they're away from the game. But, I mean, at that time, it was like players were coming together. Um, um, we had, you know, we were having so many meetings, uh, player meetings and, and, and you know, in, in, in meetings with the NBA and things like that, that we were, you know, pretty much all in the same city for most, you know, most of the time. So yeah, we would all work out together. We would get together, you know, play a little bit of, uh, uh, go get some shots up, you know, go to the gym, wait in the, in the weight room, you know, different things like that to stay in shape. Um, but I mean, that was pretty much all we could do. I mean, we, we, we couldn't go, uh, back to our, uh, to our, 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 our team, our home team, uh, where the team is, for, is because the, the team workout facility because you know everything was shut down and locked up so we had to find ways to do it on our own and uh in between you know in between the meetings and 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 whatever we had scheduled at that time now the the lockout ended relatively quickly uh obviously it went for a long period of time but overnight it seemed to have ended and then overnight, there was a, yeah yeah and it was it was probably it sounds like it was a, a midnight deal and then you signed with Minnesota. Now I didn't want—I didn't want to talk about the contract. I've already discussed why I'm not going to talk about the contract. Mm-hmm. But I, I thought it was an interesting decision to go to Minnesota. Was that? Did that have a lot to do with to play with Kevin Garnett, or did you want to? Uh, was there some something else drawing to there? Uh, the city, maybe, or you wanted to get into the Midwest? Or right. What, what was your motivations in going to play there? Um, I mean, to, to play alongside Kevin, that had a small part to do with it, but. Um, for the most part, I, I thought, you know, it was, a, it, was, it was a great fit for me where I could get back into the starting lineup. Um, they, had, they, they, they were looking for somebody to fill in that four spot. And, uh, and uh, you know, I thought that would have been per- that was the perfect opportunity, perfect fit for me. Um, play alongside Kevin, you know, a guy who we, we played, uh, uh, had a similar game, you know, from uh, inside, outside, you know, and, uh, somebody that I respected a lot, you know, just from competing against him and playing along, uh, playing against him, uh, for the, for the first couple of years, you know, I, I thought that would have been, that was a good, another great opportunity. And they were young. Stephon Marbury was our point, point guard, you know, and he was, uh, uh, pretty much, uh, one of the best point guards at the time, at that time. 
mm-hmm. and we're trying to put together a nice a nice young team and a team that can be together for a while and a team that can, uh, you know, hopefully make some noise in the future. And that well, was part of my thinking, you know. Uh, yeah. Sorry, guys. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, no, I was about to say that was part of my thinking. That was almost like my decision to go to Maryland because Maryland had the year before the recruiting class. They brought in three nice, three good freshmen uh, the year before, and then they recruited Keith Booth, and it was a nice, nice young, nice young nucleus. And I felt the same way with the Minnesota team. Okay. Well, you were right about making some noise because in the 99 playoffs, even though you were the eight seed, that, that, that season was a bit up right. and down too. I mean, Marbury was traded to Terrell Brandon. Um, it was a bit right. surprising. And, um, <laughs> so I was leaving at that. And then, because Marbury yeah, was, that's as you that. said, Marbury was, Marbury was quick, man. He, he, and, and he had a good feel for the game. People think he was a, a, a shoot first point guard. And he, he had to be in New Jersey and yeah. Phoenix. And especially in New York, but in Minnesota, he, he and Garnett complemented each other brilliantly. It almost seemed like people might think this is sacrilegious to say this, but it was almost a Stockton and Malone situation where they, they just had a, a nice feel to each other. Uh, there was obviously a connection. But then, of course, he was traded. Right. He wanted to go back home to New Jersey and, and whatever, you know, but it's. Yeah, whatever. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's disappointing because I, I always thought that. There was a couple of situations with, with you that I thought could have really impacted some championship moments. The first one was obviously Philly. I think you would have complimented once you developed because uh, you were a much better offensive player than Tyrone Hill. I think had you been on that team right. in 2001, uh, I'm not saying you guys would have beaten that 2001 team. <laughs> I don't think you would have, but I think right. it would have been a, a much more competitive series. I also think series, right. I also think it would have prolonged Iverson's uh, dominance. Because Iverson really, after 2001, he had a couple of good seasons, but he was never consistently dominant. I think it had a lot to do with the fact that he was... So much burden was on him offensively, and it's almost impossible to ask. Right. I mean, even even Jordan had Scottie Pippen to take you know some of the load off. And I think you could have right. really complimented his game a lot more. Iverson, I don't think a player in, in the history of the NBA has ever carried that offensive burden for as long as he did without any real help. I mean, you're talking about George Lynch and, and Eric Snow as the, the next best scorer. <laughs> and I don't want to disrespect them, but they were defenders. They they weren't offensive right. players. You could have been that. So that's the first thing I think of when I I think of what could have been with you. And the second thing is if mm-hmm. Stephon Marbury stayed. Because if Stephon Marbury stays, because he turned into an absolute beast in New Jersey. you got yourself, yeah. you've got Marbury, you've got Garnett. And you also have Malik Seeley. People forget about him, of course. Rest in peace to him. Yes, exactly. But he, he, he was he was a hell of a shooting guard for a long period of time as well. He was a great defender. He was an unselfish guy, but he could shoot. Yep. And uh-huh. if if you have that nucleus, he was young as well, but he was he'd been in the league for a while. And you have all that going up against Shaq, Kobe, Lakers. I think you would have given him a good run for the money. Once again, I'm not sure if you would have beaten him, but I think you would have really challenged him. I think so too, and that was part of. I mean, that was the reason why, you know, um, I, I decided on Minnesota after that lockout because, you know, like I said, they had a young team, but uh, a young team with talent, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I thought it was something that we can, you know, grow some a team that we can build and grow together, you know, for a few years, and you know, make make those championship runs uh, that, that we that we're talking about now. So um, uh, that was that was the. The, the main decision as far as going to Minnesota uh, at that time. We we started to see some of that championship fire in 99. As I said, you were the number eight seed, and you're going up against mm-hmm. the Spurs, and the Spurs were on an incredible run. This is still the lockout season. And right. people forget this, but that, that Timberwolves team, even though the, the trade of Marbury happened, they played them the best. Right. They played the Spurs. You guys played them the best out of anybody in the playoffs. And you got into it with David Robinson a little bit. I want to talk about that um, <laughs> because here you were, uh, you were six foot nine, six foot ten. Robinson's a good seven foot one, two sixty, two seventy right. pounds of all muscle. You're about two twenty, two thirty, right. and I'm being generous. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you didn't back down one bit because Garnett was he was undersized up against Duncan too, and the two of you guys right. went to the wall and. and and people might think, well, what are you talking about? You know, they lost three games to one, but those games were all all very competitive. 
And it could have easily all of them were very competitive. Mm. And and that was a that was a great series. But yeah, I mean it was um, uh, Kevin and I. That's one thing. That's one reason we like to play alongside each other because neither one of us had that back down mentality. Like I was, I went about mine a little different than his because he was a little more <laughs> outgoing. You know, you, right. he wore his emotions emotional. on his sleeve, yeah. so you know you could yeah you could see his, you could see it. But I mean. Uh, me, I was a little more quiet with mine, but at the same time, there was no backing down, and that's why we all, that's why we both like to enjoy playing alongside each other. And, uh, and that series, that was that was another one. I mean, he knew I had my hands full. We knew we had a tough battle inside, and but we both knew that neither one of us was going to was going to back down, no matter what 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 was going on out there on the floor. And like you say, David and I got into it. I thought he, he shot me a cheap elbow because uh, I was like, I mean, it was I wouldn't back down. And, you right. know, and sometimes you can get under somebody's skin when they think they have an advantage and they really don't have an advantage, you know. <laughs> right. So you can get under someone's skin. And at that point, I think I got up under his skin a little bit um, uh, on the defensive end, you know, just showing them different looks and giving them different reads. And he wasn't really able to dominate the way he was, uh, uh, the way they thought he should have. And uh, uh, it frustrated him a little bit. So he gave me a, she- a cheap shot, and I didn't like it. So, you know, words were exchanged a little bit. <laughs> well, well, see, this is how it was handled back in the day, kids. Uh, instead of going on Twitter, uh, <laughs> people That's would not, just... You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I, this you know, is a very right easy there, Right on the spot. It? <laughs> you could always post, like, a, <laughs> like some passive-aggressive tweet after the game now, right? Instead of actually... Exactly. How you <laughs> what has happened? What has happened, Jerry? That's not rhetorical. What has happened to this? No, that was rhetorical. Um, oh, no, no, that's why. Yeah, so, it's so the, <laughs> at, that, at that point, though, your career started to transition a little bit, especially in Minnesota alongside mm-hmm. Ghana. And it went from being the, uh, the, the rising up and coming player to this is your role, and you're going to. Now, all of a sudden, right. you've been in the league for four years, I'm assuming it was. And now you're the veteran. Yeah. So the question I have for you, which, right. which, which did you find more satisfying? Was it the veteran helping up the younger or going out and being the, you know, the ass kicker that you were, you know, scoring 40 against you, uh, 38 against, I think it was Philly or Boston uh, early on. So you're putting up numbers and you're right. essentially, you know, one of the stars of the league. And then at a right. very young age, you became the, the, the wise veteran. Which was more? Did you find right. get more of a kick out of that, or? Um, I mean, I enjoy both. I can't. I, mean, I enjoy both. I mean, just right. being, because uh, uh, people forget that. I mean, that, that time I chose to go to Minnesota, I was a free agent. So, at that time, I could have went somewhere where I could have been a go-to guy, and you know, got all the looks and got all the shots I wanted. But I mean, it, about me, it wasn't about, with me, it wasn't about that. It wasn't about me going out there, getting 25 looks and, you know, uh, uh, scoring 40, 45 points. If, you know, I wasn't happy if we weren't, if I was on a bad team or if I was, uh, uh, wasn't happy with the situation. So, um, I thought I'd pick the situation that I was happy with, uh, knowing that my role would change and, um, you know, I, I was willing and able to deal with it. So, uh, uh it wasn't, uh, about, not 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 wanting to be the go-to guy. I mean, I, I had that opportunity. It was a guy. It was about just one at that time. Wanting to be uh, professional, wanting to be one to win, and wanting to be in a winning situation. And I thought that Minnesota situation was uh, the best situation at that time. Who was who were the other contenders to to get your signature? And um, in '99, was was Minnesota the front runner, or did you have other options that you strongly considered? Um. Yeah, Minnesota, they were obviously, I mean, obviously the front runner. But I mean, it was obviously the choice to go back to Philly. Um, I had, uh, what, Dallas on the radar at that time. Um, uh, I think the, I think the Lakers might have wanted me to come out for, uh, uh, wanted, wanted me at that time. They needed somebody to put in as a four. Mm. Um, I mean, it, it, it was, it was, it was quite a few teams. It was quite right. a few teams. Uh, every time, every time, good thing, every time I was a free yeah. agent, yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. Every time I be, I was a free agent, or my name came up for a trade. I mean, it was, I wasn't, you know, being 
looked at by, you know, the bottom, the bottom of the league. I was, you know, being requested and asked for it and, and looked at by, you know, key, key teams and key players that needed somebody to come in and play a key role. So, I mean, that's, that's, that, that makes you feel good as a player knowing that, you know, teams need you as a key piece and they feel they need you as a key piece, uh, to, to, to get to that next level. Absolutely, because you think about it, that they've, they have championship aspirations. They're taking it seriously. They're not, that's not like what the Clippers right, were exactly. during that time that were just not interested in winning or competing at all. Obviously, you know, that's right. changed over the last five or six years with Blake Griffin and Chris Paul, but, you know, they, they were a laughing stock for a long time. And, yes, they were. <laughs> but, but Dallas was up and coming. I mean, Dallas had that stigma for a while too, but they had drafted Nowitzki, yeah. they had, uh, signed Nash, uh, uh Traded from uh, Michael yeah, Finley, Michael and that was, that, and, yeah, yeah, and I know obviously Philly was taking things very serious. I mean, you don't pay your coach five, six million a year back then unless you're taking things very seriously. Right, exactly. And of course, the Lakers—they exactly. had Shaq, Kobe, uh, Glenn Rice—I think was on that team. Um, yeah. there, there was there was quite a lot of uh, veterans that were obviously that, what we saw. They they became. I think Ori was a four, but I think they were looking for uh, another four. Mm. Well, Horry probably would have come off the bench then. I think you would have got the starting Off the bench, right, right exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We've talked about how you, your career sort of evolved. And the, the surprising thing to me is because you played a, a thousand, over a thousand games. You played with, uh, people mm-hmm. don't realize this, you played with, obviously we're talking about Iverson, Garnett. You've also played with Kobe, right. LeBron, Carmelo, mm-hmm. and for a brief period, Kevin Durant. You played alongside Jerry Stackhouse when he scored 57 points in in Chicago, of all places. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean you, you played... He, he had a hell of a year that year as well. He averaged 30 and was an all-star. Yeah, so you played yeah. What's surprising to me is there's been no real mention or... And maybe this is on your end, like, is there a motivation there? But there's been no interest in you being a coach. What, what's happened there? <laughs> I put um, you on the spot there, didn't okay. I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I wouldn't mind getting into coaching. I mean, right now I have uh, my basketball academy, but I wouldn't mind getting into coaching. I mean, uh, uh, I got to actually went out uh, when Jeff Hornacek was coaching in Phoenix. He was looking for a big man coach, and I went out there and applied for it. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get it, but if my opportunity arises, I wouldn't mind stepping into that and into, um, uh, doing some coaching. Um uh, but like I say, right now I have the skills, uh, the uh, basketball academy, and I'm, I do the training side now. So until I get into coaching, I do some fundamental trainings and skills, fundamental training and skills training to, to make sure that future basketball is safe. I, I, I'm just looking at your resume, man. Like, as I said, you've, you've, there's not a whole lot of situations that you haven't experienced firsthand. And, right. And, and that's, you, I mean, and that's the thing about that, man. I know I have a lot, a lot of experience and a lot of things, uh, things I can, I can bring to a team. Um, uh, and that's what kept me around for 16 years. Uh, that's you know, you think towards the end of my career when you're the veteran, uh, you know, kind of grooming the younger guys, you know, you, you, you have to be able to, uh, you have to know how to talk to these guys and be able to relate to them. And that's something I've always been able to do. That's, that brings up an interesting, interesting question. Have you, became not just a veteran, but a really an elder statesman of those teams. I mean, you're still productive, but you were, mm-hmm. you were, did the coaches ever come to you and say, hey, we're thinking about running this, and they started to strategize with you? Because we saw that with Sam Cassell with Boston, and, and they, they became almost assistant coaches more than they were players. Did you ever right. assume that role? Did they, did you find coaches coming to you, like, trying to pick your brain a little bit? Yeah. I've had assistants do that to me, and um, uh, especially my, my, maybe my last uh, two or three years. Um, especially if, it, and if it's a team that I was I, I was on before, or if it's somebody that um, I'm familiar with guarding or something like that, I've had coaches uh, come up to me and you know ask me you know what type of success how how I've how I've had success against these guys and or you know what what have I noticed throughout my career that was successful against, you know, different teams and stuff like that. So I, uh, especially towards the, the, the last two or three years of my career, you know, I had a little more input, you know, and, and, and I wouldn't say the game plan, so to speak, but in how, uh, and, and, and some of the, not, uh, uh, some of the scouting report that, that they would put out. 
Did you ever find that coaches would come to you about an individual matchup, say Kenyon Martin or Tim Duncan or Kevin Garnett, guys that you, you would have played against or played with even uh, for extended periods of time and say, hey, what's the strategy? What's the best way to approach guarding this guy or slowing him down? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's happened uh, quite a few times, with, uh, especially with Timmy, uh, Timmy and uh, Kevin, uh, Tim Duncan and Kevin Garnett. Um, uh, you know, I played from college. It's where Timmy started in college. So I, I know, you know, we played against him since he was at Wake Forest and I was at Maryland. Right. Uh, with Kevin just throughout my career. And like I said, and, and, it, and it started happening towards the end of my career. And, um, you know, those guys were still, you know, playing high number of minutes and still, you know, very productive for their team. So, uh, the younger guys that, uh, uh, they had to end up, they had to guard on most of the game or things like that. Uh, the coaches would bring them to me or, you know, the coach would come to me, assistant coach would come to me himself to ask me, you know, how, 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 how I've been successful or, you know, how I've guarded these guys before. And, you know, I give them my input, you know, tell them what to take away, what not to give them. And, you know, they would input, input that into something, into the scout report and, and, and to our, uh, defensive, into our defensive game plan, you know, whatever it may be. We'll finish up your NBA career because I want to talk about your academy after this. We'll finish up your NBA career and you did okay. play in one other huge game, which I've got to get your thoughts on, which was okay. uh, game seven of the 2008 uh, conference semifinals between the Cavs and uh, Celtics. And that was in Boston. Oh, I don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 was, I, I don't want to get into details, but I want to talk about your role specifically there because obviously LeBron and Paul Pierce were going at it. Now, in a game of that magnitude, right. how, how hard is it to focus when two guys are going at it like that? How hard is it to focus and lock in on your specific uh, role and assignments when, you know, you're seeing an historic duel really play out right in front of you? Or does it, do you right. become even extra focused because you're like, we've, we're right there, we're so close, we've got to get this? Tell, tell us about your mentality. Right. No, you actually become extra focused because you're trying to figure out what can I do to help us get over this hump. I mean, right. that's that's the type of thinking that I have, you know. Like, it's, you got an epic battle going on, you know, like you said, between Paul and, and LeBron. Now I got to figure out what can I do to help LeBron. <laughs> yeah, right. Paul, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, you know. Well, they could keep you on the court a little bit longer. That would have helped. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, 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 that's true, too. That's true, too. But, I mean, uh uh, while you're out there, you know, you're just trying to figure out what can you do. And um, I, I felt, uh, um, you know, we had some other advantages that we could have taken advantage of uh, inside, but um, uh, it didn't work out that way. But uh, I thought that was a great, se- great season. I mean, great series. But the mentality is, is, is that you have to have as a as one of the other guys is, you know, what can I do to help us get, help us get over this hump. Uh, let's let's talk about your your basketball academy and uh, what else you've been doing to keep busy after after your retirement. So, uh, okay, you you're talking that you coach up uh, kids. Yeah, I have uh, my Joe Smith Academy uh, for boys and girls, and uh, my I do skills training, fundamental training. Um, is the sessions are usually an hour long. They're um, uh, either, either individual or small groups. I don't try, I don't do large groups, uh, cause I want to be able to focus on the kids and focus on their, on, on their, uh, on, on them getting better and be able to, uh, when it's correct them, when I see something wrong, be able to correct them right away and, 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 and try to keep the groups, uh, no more than about five kids when I do have kid, uh, groups. <clears throat> but the, uh, the, the sessions, they consist of, uh, footwork, agility, um, ball handling, shooting, shooting off the dribble, shooting off the move, uh, uh, defensive work. Um, so pretty much everything. I mean, is it, is it, all all it, the skills required. Pretty, yeah, pretty much everything. Yeah, I'll I take you through everything. You know, uh, but, but please tell me you, you don't, you don't work on forty foot jump shots. Yeah, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> now, <with that. laughs> not at all. I mean, that's the thing about it. Most of the kids, I mean, they. They want to come in and they think they're going to get a uh, three point. Uh, There's going to be a three point shootout when they come in. But uh, my, my 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 drills are mostly um, attacking the basket mid range, 
um, all the way out to the three point line, not past the three point line until we get to the end of practice when we just uh when we're taking three point shots and I want them to get some three point shots up. And that's still not for everybody. That's just for uh who I feel uh are good enough and capable of knocking down the three point shot. But most of it is a, is, is mid range and, and, and attacking the basket, showing these kids how to really, you know, use their use their skills and use and use their ability to keep pressure on the defense and not bail them out by just launching out threes. Okay. And how can people uh how can people attend these this academy? How how can they get in touch with you? You can either follow me on Instagram as Joe underscore Smith underscore academy. My website is Joe Smith Academy dot org. Yep, I also have uh, my per- my personal uh Twitter my per- personal Twitter is Joe Beast J O E B E A S T ninety five. That's Twitter. Same thing on Instagram, Joe Beast ninety five on Instagram. Facebook is just Joe Smith. It might be hard to find because you <laughs> Yeah, that, that doesn't sound like an uncommon name, name, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Joe Smith, yeah. So you might have. So where does the beast come from? Well, I've got to ask you this before I let you go. Where, where does the beast come from? No, that's what they used to call me in college. And uh, oh right, okay. Uh, when I got to Maryland, yeah, when I got to Maryland, that was my nerves. Everybody just called me the beast. Um, part of my NBA career, that was uh, team, the team, my team. That was, of course, that's what everybody called me. So um, I just put it, uh, put it with my first name and. Actually, it just started off as my artist name because I, 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 write, I write and do music as well. So, uh, Joe Beast was my artist, my artist name as well. And that's what, that's do you have a Joe SoundCloud for that? Or? Yeah, actually, I do. And that's Nova Unit, N O V A U N I T, on SoundCloud. And um, I have music posted up there. I, I got to update the music now. I'm in the process of working on a new project. So I'm going to update the music within the next couple of weeks or so, but there's music up there. All right, sounds awesome. We'll, we'll keep our audience updated with that as well. Joe, it's been an absolute pleasure. Okay. Did you have uh, any final questions or, or comments? Um, I think we're good. Um, I don't have anything else, I think. I think you you covered everything. <laughs> well, everything that we wanted to cover. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, everything that needed to be covered. As, as I said, it's been an absolute pleasure and honor. Um, you know, I, I, I want to get you back on at some point. So if you, like, I okay. don't know, just before the, the playoffs start, we can go through some teams, tell us what your thoughts are of the, of the season. And uh, okay, maybe we'll do a call-in show where we have people call in and uh, ask you questions uh, directly. How does that sound? I would love to do that. I would love to do that. Do, like, a little... Uh, 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 Postseason wrap up or pre yeah. pre playoff uh, <laughs> yeah 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 something like that yeah, yeah. okay and, cool. um, I would love that yeah. I would love that cool let, let, let's we'll, we'll we'll schedule something uh, around March April and uh, yeah as I said an absolute pleasure and if if any of you guys call me a, a bust you're going to be banned, banned from my page so I'm not going to hear it <laughs> I'm not going to hear it <laughs> thank you so much Joe <laughs> nah all right I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on. All right, take care, man. All right, you too. Bye-bye now.